it's a, it's something that'll change the world and human life as we know it. He knows he's seen the light. When Monty talks, it's painful. <laughs> Monty, you have been so instrumental in uh, kind of pointing me in the right direction. <laughs> it was about um, looking at your character defects and spirituality. Uh, it, it's the integration of clinical practices with uh, the 12 steps. It's an absolute pleasure. He certainly knows a lot of people. Uh, he's got a lot of energy. And sometimes when you don't have so much energy, he picks you up and carries and you. And the Monty man there certainly helps. This is one of the places that is about the business of the solution. The views expressed on this special broadcast of the K-12 radio show do not necessarily reflect those of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting or its affiliates. KHLT is not affiliated with any particular 12-step fellowship. Now here's that guy who's getting less popular minute by minute, your host, the Multiman. And greetings, friends and family, those of you in recovery, those of you who are advocates of, and perhaps some of you who should be, welcome to Take12Radio.com on your internet dial, broadcasting to you from the studios uh, and the outskirts of beautiful downtown Albany, Oregon, here at the KHLT Recovery Broadcasting uh, audio booth right here, right now. Welcome to those of you who are listening on the Bill Post Radio Network. Welcome aboard. And uh, we've uh, we've just got a whole bunch of stuff for you out there, all of you that that live in Oregon or listening on that network. Uh, visit our website at take12radio.com. Our email address is take12radio at comcast.net. And for those of you listening on our network, you already know all that stuff, right? And if you forget it, just go to the About Us or the contact link at take12radio.com. Well, welcome, welcome aboard. <clears throat> we are so uh, privileged to be able to broadcasting uh, broadcast to you. We've been broadcasting now. Uh, June fifth was ten years. Can you believe it? And, and it's because of you guys. It's because uh, if there's nobody listening, then who are we talking to? And uh, what I just love about this show is we don't just preach to the choir. There's so many of you out there that, that email us and call us and want to know what is going on. Uh, I don't understand my loved one. I don't know uh, what is this codependency stuff. What What is addiction? What is alcoholism? On and on and on. And I just love those kinds of correspondence because um, – if we're just preaching to the choir, then then what, what good are we doing? So just just welcome aboard all, all of you, uh, especially uh, some family members uh, as of late who've become new listeners. All right, uh, t- today on the show, uh, and, and we've had this gentleman on, uh, on on several occasions. It is always an honor to have Ken Seeley uh, on on our show. Ken is the founder and CEO of Ken Seeley Recovery Communities and Intervention Nine One One whose new ending began the day he entered drug and alcohol treatment on July 14th, 1989. Now, if you're scratching your head thinking, what does that mean, new ending? Well, I'm going to ask Ken about that here in just a minute. Uh, After battling the demons of his own personal addictions, Ken Seeley has not only remained clean and sober, but he has gone on to become one of the foremost experts in the treatment and recovery process for addictions of all kinds. Ken was a featured interventionist on the hit A&E television series Intervention for the first eight seasons, during which time he formed his own intervention service organization called Intervention 911. From there, his vision for a full-spectrum continuum of care for individuals afflicted with addiction seeking treatment uh, that processes into long-term sobriety spawned the formation of Ken Seeley Communities. Ken Seeley Communities focuses on care and recovery planning after leaving treatment, provides sober hotels uh, which offer access to services to help a person regain confidence in all aspects of everyday life, such as work, education, and independence. Ken is helping others figure out how to create their own new ending. Ken, welcome back to the show, my friend. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Congratulations on 10 years. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, my friend. I, I just, I really appreciate that. Well, let's get right to, to this this phrase, um, a, new, a new ending. What do you mean by a new ending, creating a new ending? A 
new ending. Yeah. Um, a new ending for, you know, people that, you know, their, their lives are miserable in their disease, and now we have a new uh, way to enjoy their lives. I mean, it's just horrible how many people out there, the families are suffering, and we, we can help them. The, the ending changing where you're not ending up in jails, institutions, and death. You know, you can have an amazing life um, in recovery, and we want to help support that with families and, and people that are out there suffering. Be, because the truth of the matter is, <clears throat> we're dealing with the number one health crisis in our nation, and uh, the ending is going to be horrible if, if people don't, don't receive intervention, if people don't have support, if people don't have the tools uh, that are so necessary in order to recover. Let, let me ask you this. Do you, do you find that, uh, do you think stigma is in, do you think the breaking through the stigma of addiction is improving or do you think we've gone backwards or is it pretty much the same? No, I think that the stigma is absolutely improving, but I think the wrong message that people are getting is that recovery is, um, you know, a quick fix. It's a five-year plan. You know, when people hit their five-year mark is when they're, you know, it's just like cancer. If you hit the five-year mark, your your cancer is in remission, and you you pretty much could live cancer-free. Well, this is identical. If you're able to hit that five-year mark, you are pretty much got a good chance of long-term recovery. So recovery is a process. You know, there is no quick fix for it, and I think that's the wrong message that we're sending to the public is they think that they can go to treatment and then they're cured. Right, right, and, and and more often than not, it's it's like a thirty day thing, and <clears throat> what some of us affectionately call the thirty day spin cycle, and the person hasn't even <clears throat> really cleared their head enough to even talk about how they're feeling. Right? Exactly, exactly right. I mean, they <clears throat> they, they barely get to that. I mean, that's in that's in treatment. They're barely detoxed after thirty days. Right. But then they go through the treatment process. That's why the AMA, American Medical Association, says it should be a minimum of 90 days. And then you do intensive outpatient, and then you do sober living. And, you know, it's a whole long process. And unfortunately, the, the people out there think that they could go to 30 days treatment. And, you know, especially now that we have our sober living, families are like, oh, well, they should be better by now. You know, why, why is this taking so long? They don't get that it's a process, and, and it's not their fault. It's just our fault as working in the industry. We're not communicating that. You, you know, for, for a long time, you've heard it, I've heard it for, for years. We, we hear people in, 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 and please, listeners, don't misunderstand. Um, I, am not, I am not downplaying the 12-step community at all. Uh, I'm a 12-stepper myself. Uh, you know, it is, it has been a process that has saved my life. Um, but I think sometimes we get away from the actual outline of the program of the 12 steps and we get more into the fellowship of the meetings and we have lost some of the importance of the spiritual aspect of this thing, as well as the work that needs to be done. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's always about the work. You have to stay in, in involved in your recovery process. It's not about just showing up and going to meetings. It's about doing the work. You know, I have, you know, next week I'll have 25 years sober, God willing. Wow. And, you know, I'm still doing the work. You know, I still do, you know, meditation and yoga on a regular basis and I, you know, therapy and all kinds of work that I have to stay involved to keep my addiction my addiction at far. Just, just like Otherwise, any, it's going to come back and get me. Just like anybody, like, I'm diabetic. I, I have to take my medication. I have to eat clean. I have to make sure that, that I, I don't eat anything that, that is sugar or turns to a large amount of sugar. I can't just stop that after five years, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, if we could send that message to people, I think you know, they would get it. And what we're coming up with is a new plan of showing the secret of how to get to that five-year plan. You know, nobody knows, how do I get to that five-year plan? How do I get to that five-year plan? We have evidence-based statistics that are out there that we could show families how to get to that five-year plan. Right, right. Well, well, tell us about, uh, tell us about your transition from A&E's intervention to Intervention 911. You were developing Intervention 911 
while you were involved with A and E, weren't you? Yeah, I've had that long before the show was even created. Oh, okay. Intervention on the one. What is what exactly is Intervention Nine One One? It's not a television show. We know that, right? What is it? Yeah, no, it's a, a private company that does exactly what the TV show, you know, shows people what to do. You know, intervenes on the family's behalf. Um, we have interventionists all over the country, um, so we go out there and and help the families convince their loved ones to get the help that they need. And, and you, uh, you, you're familiar, very familiar with Matt Brown, who's on our board. Uh, he's an interventionist as well. Uh, and, and I, you know, we did a whole series on what intervention is and what it isn't with Tony uh, Messbarger here not too long ago. Um, what is, <clears throat> what is the number one obstacle that you find when working with people when? when dealing with their loved ones when it comes to intervention? Is it something that that the active addict uh, uh, brings to the table, or is it more of the family? Yeah, I think it's more of the family. If you could educate the family appropriately, I think you've got a really good chance at saving the person, the addict's life. But if you don't educate the family appropriately on setting bottom lines and um, helping support their recovery instead of their disease, their addiction, right. uh, then they don't have a chance. You know, there's no way that they're going to be able to make it if the family doesn't have the tools on how to either support their recovery or their addiction. What are, what are some of the um, <clears throat> what what are some of the misunderstandings family members have about the addict? They think that they don't have any say in them either continuing in their recovery or in their addiction. And the family has a huge part in that. They have all the tools necessary to support recovery. And getting a, a good interventionist, like you said, Matt is an amazing interventionist, getting a good interventionist out there and helping them support recovery, that's the only way they get it. You know, if they, they don't understand that, they're not going to get it. Yeah, right, right. So they have to get that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um so tell us about some of the services, some of the unique services Intervention 911 offers. Yeah, the, the, the unique services that we offer is that, you know, years ago doing interventions from 2000 when I started, um, you know, it was only about getting the person to treatment. Now it's about not only getting that person to treatment, but getting that person into long-term recovery. So with that, it takes finding an appropriate 90-day inpatient treatment facility. After you find the 90-day inpatient treatment facility, and again, that could be broken down in many ways. If the family doesn't have the resources for 90 days, you could do 30 days of inpatient, and you could do intensive outpatient with sober living. But, you know, really getting them enmeshed in really a lot of therapy in that first 90 days. Like you first said, the first 30 days, they're barely detoxed. So getting them in therapy for that long, and then once they get out of therapy, you know, making sure that they're accountable in their recovery, um, and, and we do case management, like the doctor diversion programs have been doing for 28 years, you know, Intervention 911 started doing case management about five or six years ago, and we followed the people for that first 12 months of their recovery. Uh, okay, so when a person comes in to... <clears throat> Uh, to the facility. Now, you have 70 to 80 beds in Palm Springs, right? Of sober living, correct. Of sober living, right. When they come into a sober living environment, what are some of the, the um, I know some people don't like this word, but it's 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 a necessary evil, I suppose. What are some of the rules? I mean, what are some of the, the boundaries that are set for a sober living environment? Yeah, we like to call it structure. You know, structure, there you go. Out there have no structure in their lives, and that's why they can't get sober. And so what we do is we help them, you know, with the structure necessary to support their recovery. And, you know, um, in the, at the very we have phases in our sober living, and we have people from all over the country that go to treatment, and then they come to our sober living in Palm Springs because of the structure that we have. And it's not just uh, the old-fashioned, you know, mindset of, uh, um, I can't even remember what they used to call them, but there was a name for the sober livings that, 
you know, they randomly drug test once in a while, and there's no accountability of them going to meetings or working a program at all. Right. You know, um, and that's the old model of sober living. Now it's more of a heavily structured. So like I said, we get people from all over the country coming down. And, and then when they leave us, we refer them to another form of a sober living that is the lesser accountability. Right. It's part of it. Right. Uh, Ken, we're going to take our first break. And when we come back, I, I've got I've got a uh, I've got kind of a controversial question about sober living for you folks. Don't go away. More with our guests. Ken Seeley, founder and CEO of Ken Seeley Recovery Communities and Intervention 911. Don't miss it. We'll be right back. Hey, this is the Monty Man at Take 12 Recovery Radio. You know, for way too long, the faith community and church leadership has had a misunderstanding of what addiction and recovery is really all about. Well, it's time we clear up some issues. Recovery Life presents Understanding Addiction and Recovery, an informational workshop focused on educating the faith community, clergy, lay people, and church leadership on the problem and solution of alcoholism and addiction. Friday nights, 7 to 9 p.m. at Oak Creek Christian Center, 5775 Columbus Street Southeast, Albany, Oregon. Gender-specific recovery life groups and support meetings for friends and families will form during the workshops. For more information, visit recoverywife.org. Recovery Life, a community outreach for the Willamette Valley in cooperation with Oak Creek Christian Center. Men, women, and their families experience tremendous pain and suffering due to the struggles they face from substance abuse and its co-occurring mental health challenges. They need to find a safe place for peace and healing. Therapia Addiction Healing Center was born out of a deep desire to provide that safe and powerful healing environment. Therapia exists to help people recover from addictions by developing and maintaining healthy, meaningful relationships with God, self, and others. To speak with an addiction specialist, call 1-855-652-4325. That's 1-855-652-4325. Or visit our website at www.therapia.net. Therapia Addiction Healing Center. Restoring lives one step at a time. He's a little crazy, but then again... You already knew that. I got in like three fights when I was in grade school. All three of them were with the bully. You know, we all know who they are. They're always a little bit bigger, a little bit kind of smelly, and we duke it out. And after he beat the snot out of me, I'd say, you come back tomorrow and I'll give you more of that. It's the Bill Post Radio Show. Bill Post Radio Show. Weekdays at noon. All right, so we have returned the Doobie Brothers. I always love the name of that group. I wonder why. Gee, Willikers. All right, Ken Seeley is our guest, uh, founder and CEO of Ken Seeley Recovery Communities and Intervention 911, uh, former host of, of, uh, of one of the, uh, one of re- really the nation's top uh, television programs that focused on intervention and called Intervention, uh, A&E's uh, production. Uh, and we've been talking about uh, 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 sober living a little bit. It can th- there is something, and I'm I'm not going to name the the organization. They're they're quite large. Um, they do something uh, a sober living environment that has always always concerned me, and that is that they're self governing and there's no there doesn't seem to be any any leadership. It's just kind of all throwing up in the air and and my experience has been in working with sponsees over the years and and folks involved at least in this part of the country that some of these homes uh people aren't going to meetings people aren't working in any kind of recovery program it's like you said the the um the the you know the taking uh urine tests and so forth are, are are just are few and far between there's no accountability it's just a place where the only thing that's not tolerated is if you relapse then you then they kick you out uh i don't get i don't get that 
Uh, have you run into that frustration? Oh my God, that is, that drives me crazy. That that people are allowed to operate those and call them sober livings because people are dying because of that. They think that they're in some type of structure, and really there is no accountability. And you know? we're lucky that we live in Southern California because down here there's something called the Sober Living Coalition. And to be a member, there has to be structure and accountability. So, you know, I, I, I encourage every state to look into, you know, creating a sober living coalition um, and, and doing that. So there is, there isn't, we don't send that bad message because you're right. There's so many people out there. They're like landlords. All they really are is they, they, they rent houses or buy houses and they throw a bunch of people in them and get 10 times the amount of money they could for renting the house on its own. Right. They call themselves sober living. It's, it's heartbreaking. Yeah, and, 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 and I, I know the owner of several of these, and uh, it, it, he confuses me because he, he, I, I say, look, look at, I, I said, you've got women coming into the men's homes, servicing the men. You've got, you've got uh, you know, computers with, you know, pornography going on day and night. You got... Where's the recovery in this? He says, well, you can't. The law says because they're single family dwellings, you cannot tell an adult that he's got to be in by 10 o'clock. And I'm like, but isn't there an agreement? Isn't there something that they sign that that I, I, I just don't get it? I, I um, makes me wonder if it isn't about the money sometimes. Yeah, that's that's not true. It's the law says that you can't tell them a curfew. That's like telling anybody that lives under your roof that they can't have a curfew so if you have kids in your house that you know you want them home at a certain time right you know that you you could you could tell them that they got if they want to live under your roof under your rules you could you could make any house rules that you want i know growing up i had a lot of house rules i had to take out the trash i had to you know clean my room i had to make my bed you know i had to be in at a certain time so it's it's just the Sober Living Coalition really helps identify that, that you could create any house rules you want, and there is no law-breaking um, that happens by creating those, those um, yeah. that structure. Well, that's what I figured. That's what I figured. So I, I, don't, I, I don't know. Well, y- you know, uh, bless their hearts anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let, let's, uh, let, let's talk a minute about... Um, uh, RAP, Recovery Advocate Program. What's that all about? Yeah, what we did is, like I, I was saying earlier, is we took the doctor diversion programs, the high license professionals for nurses, lawyers, pilots, and we watched what they've been doing for the last 28 years. And the only difference that they have and what the other people that have that can't obtain long-term recovery and don't get the percentages they're from and drug court programs from like 70 percent to 90 percent successful from two to five years and the only difference that they have is they're offered all the same things they're offered treatment they're offered all that you know the recovery process during the recovery process but there's nobody holding the torch and carrying them through it So when you're in a drug court, it's called your parole officer. You know, the parole officer is holding that torch and carrying it through it for that year and a half to two years to make sure you're doing everything you're supposed to in your recovery. For high-licensed professionals, it's called their case manager. And that case manager is communicating with their therapist, the treatment center, you know, their group therapies that they go to, and they carry that torch for five to ten years in the diversion programs. And that's the missing link. That's the only missing link. So five years ago, we called it, the, you know, people don't want, addicts don't want um, a case manager, for sure. We definitely don't want them to have a parole officer. You know, we don't want them to have legal consequences like that. Right. So what we called it is a recovery assistance program. And... That's what the wrap is. It's that, it's that person carrying the torch that's communicating to everybody, the sponsor in AA. Are they really working their steps that they say they're working? You know, what step are they on? Um, 
again, we don't want to know the gory details of their fourth step, of course. Right, right. But we do need to know, are they participating? Are they showing up at their meetings? You know, we need somebody to be uh, the ears and the eyes on the ground and somebody to be able to check on that. And that's the only missing link to get 70 to 90% success rate in long-term recovery. There's nothing else missing. And with that comes random drug testing. So what you're talking about is is the word accountability. That's all it is, accountability. If you have some accountability in your life, just like anything else in life. Like you said, you have diabetes. There's accountability around that to support your recovery if you're diabetes. You bet. You bet. So so what what is your opinion on drug courts? Drug courts, I think, are the best things out there for people that have to hit that type of a low bottom. Right. Um, actually, I was just talking to Judge um, Ferdinand out of the Brooklyn Drug Court yesterday, uh, her office, because, you know, I've been to their graduations um, and, and really see that these are people that had no hope. They lost everything. Right. And they're showing up with their families, with their kids at their graduation. Um, because of, again, that continuity of somebody following them for that two-year protocol, they're able to make it in recovery. We all know the first year is the hardest year to get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, had, uh, we had a gal on who's the coordinator for uh, the Oregon Department of Corrections, uh, coordinator for drug courts uh, here in Lynn County, and I, I went, I, I had never been to one. I, I went and sat in on a drug court. I was absolutely blown away. The, the, these guys and gals were being talked to like human beings. They were talk, being talked to by the judge with respect. I mean, it was like a level playing field, but there was this strong accountability. It was marvelous. That's it, accountability. Yeah, yeah. It's that simple. If we could hold each other accountable to our recoveries, to our recovery, we all have a better chance at long-term recovery. Right, right. Nobody it, holds us accountable, then we just fall to our own devices. And what do addicts do it to their own devices? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and we've been teaching, you know, we, we have this kind of mamsy, pamsy kind of attitude sometimes in our 12-step fellowships. Well, a sponsor really isn't supposed to tell you what to do or anything like that. And I'm like, you know, my sponsor, when I first got it, he called me on my, uh, he, first of all, he says, I need your permission because I'm not going to do it without your permission, but I need your permission that to yank on your chain anytime I think you're going down a road that's going to be destructive. And so once I gave that to him, um, I was so grateful because the times that he was not correct, I would rather he be wrong and I got a little offended than he be right and not say anything. <laughs> you know, and then I die behind that. Let, let me ask you this question, Ken. Um, uh, Nora Val, uh, I think I'm pronouncing your name right, Volk, Cow, she is the uh, or was the director of National Institute on Drug Abuse. I I'm not a real fan of hers necessarily because it, yeah, the spiritual side isn't a big thing with them. But she made a statement that that uh, I really agree with. Um, she said treatment does not need to be voluntary to be effective. Sanctions or enticements from family, employment settings, and or the criminal justice system can significantly increase treatment entry, retention rates, and the ultimate success of drug treatment interventions. Do you agree that treatment does not need to be voluntary to be effective? 150% sitting here with close to 25 years sober, like I said, on the 14th of 24, five sober, and I did not want to go to treatment. I right. was intervened on. I did not want it. I wasn't ready to go to get sober. I had no plans in getting sober. I hated AA. I had, you know, I used, I went to meetings for four years, and I couldn't stand it. So right. I agree a hundred and fifty percent with of her statement on that. Yeah, me too. Me, me too. Because the truth be known, most of us did. We we came kicking and screaming. You know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, if we wait for the person to want, and that's another thing we talk about. In twelve step circles, well, they gotta want it. Well, yeah, that's a, that's nice, but if we wait till the person wants it, they just might die. Well, that's why I said, you know, I love what Matt and every and what all of us do. 
interventionist is because, you know, we, we have to want it. They're right at one level. But what can we do to create a scenario where they want it? Yeah. Like they have that saying, you could drink, you could feed a horse to water, but you can't drink, make them drink. Well, we could make it damn thirsty. Yeah, there you go. Around the park a few times, or, <laughs> <laughs> you know, to make it real thirsty. Right, right. All right, we're going to take our next break. When we come back, let's talk about Ken Seeley Recovery Communities. Don't go away, my friends. Uh, we'll be back here in uh, just a few with more with our guest uh, Ken Seeley here at Take12Radio.com on your internet dial, Recovery Talk and Positive Music. Serenity Springs Recovery Center, located on the beautiful east coast of Florida, a unique facility that is committed to providing exceptional individual care in small group settings while utilizing their experienced and dedicated clinical and support staff of licensed therapists and doctors. Visit their website, serenitysprings.recovery.com or call 386-423-4540. Serenity Springs, making a life-changing investment into your recovery. We understand that having a loved one caught in the grips of an addiction is a powerless position to be in. And we understand this on a very personal level. We have been there ourselves. Our own families have experienced exactly what you are feeling now. The good news is we are here to direct you in finding a way out. We are Freedom Interventions, providing the direction necessary to get the help for your addicted loved one. Your family has specific needs. We can determine the best approach for your specific circumstances. If an intervention is needed, we will provide the direction required to safely and effectively accomplish the goal of recovery for all. To begin the recovery process for your loved one, call toll-free at 888-762-7557. That's 888-762-7557. And visit our website at freedominterventions.com. Freedom Interventions, providing drug and alcohol interventions and a continuum of care services to clients and their families. Origins Recovery Centers provides integrated inpatient treatment for substance abuse and co-occurring disorders. At Origins, clients receive expert medical, clinical, and spiritual care individually designed for their needs. Our clients leave Origins with the foundation upon which they will build the rest of their lives. Call now to speak with an admissions specialist. Our toll-free number is 888-843-8935. That's 888-843-8935. Origins, delivering real solutions for real families. No time for a gentle rain. No time for my watch and chain. All right, welcome back. <clears throat> Ken Seeley is our guest uh, here at Take12Radio.com on your internet dial uh, this week on uh, Interview Thursday. Uh, founder and CEO of uh, Ken Seeley Recovery Communities and Intervention 911. <clears throat> Ken, uh, what is Ken Seeley Recovery Communities? Well, like I said, we started Intervention 911 and did the RAP program. <clears throat> right. And then, and then we realized that that still wasn't enough that people needed to be housed in a sober living. And like you talked about, you know, people going to sober living isn't really a sober living. It's just a, a place that they, uh, they, they live that other people are trying to stay sober, but the structure and the accountability isn't there. So that's when we decided three years ago we needed that level of care. It was missing in a lot of places. So we created 80 beds down in Palm Springs that we do that with. Now, now that's, go, ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that's just part of uh, the, the Ken Seeley communities that we have. And then we also have the treatment community that you're asking about. And we do trainings all over the country. We did, we're did. we doing five in 2014, but we're trying to do like four a year with Southworth and Associates. And we train people on how to do interventions. And then we help treatment centers. Like treatment centers sponsor it. But the reason why they like sponsoring it is because they bring their clinical team there. And they, because you're always intervening, even if you're in treatment. Like that, I love that statement that we just talked about. Does somebody have to want it? And, they're, and absolutely not. But when they want to leave, which we all do, 
when we're in treatment, you're re-intervening, re-intervening. So the intervention trainings help people, clinicians, on how to intervene and get the family system involved. Um, how important is it that families understand that they really need to leave the intervention up to the professionals and not try to do it on their own? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the, I mean, I, I was so honored to be a part of this show, but the one misconception that was, you know, came out of that show is that family members think that, you know, an intervention is easy. All you have to do is um, read some letters and boom, you, you know, they go to treatment and it's that easy because that's what they see on TV. Right. But the pre-intervention that I conduct could last from a minimum of four hours up to eight hours, you know, educating the family on the disease concept and how they're supporting the disease and not supporting recovery. And now that we're going to make a shift and start so only supporting recovery, what are the healthy boundaries that we're going to put into place? So that, that takes hours and hours there's no way to televise that but, you know it's just way too long so you know the positive in it is that they see that there's something they could do the negative is they think that they could do it on their own and they can't they need a professional there right right and, and so when you when you're doing an intervention <clears throat> do, do you ask <clears throat> Excuse me, I got something on my throat there. Do, do you are, are you primarily primarily the one that's doing most of the talking during the intervention itself? Yeah, when the addicts in the room. Yeah, absolutely not. My job is the day before where I prep the family on what to say or what not to say because if I do most of the talking, it's kind of like. Um, if I start doing most of the talking, yeah. they'll never see me again in their lives. Ah, yeah, that's true. And what I have to say means nothing to them. So, you know, their family members are the ones that need to present these bottom lines and the love that they have for them. They're the ones that are going to make a difference and make the change. It's my job to help them understand how to make that difference. And do you, do you find uh, on occasion that there are other family members that are that are also being uh, uh, that are afflicted by active addiction, not just the person that's being intervened on? Oh, the family members are tortured with the addict's behaviors. But what about their own? I mean, is there is there sometimes maybe dad is an active alcoholic as well? Oh yeah, that happens. I would say about. 10% of my interventions, there's another addict in the room. And then when um, we get down to it, I kind of do like a mini intervention on them during the pre-intervention. Right. And I say, hey, you're asking them to go away for 90 days to a year, you know, to get treatment for this, but you're not willing to go do it. If they say, hey, what about you? You're an addict too, and you're not willing to do that. What kind of message is that sending to them? Why would they do it? Right, right. You have to intervene on them and get them. And, and I always say, you know, in my interventions, is the family is also going to get their support. You know, they're going to go to Al-Anon. They're going to be participate in recovery themselves. So it's not only the addict that's going away for the, the treatment, but family is going to get treated also. Because if the... If the person in recovery comes back from treatment and they're launched into the same environment they just came out of, their chances are not good, right? No, I mean, there's a saying out there that they say, uh, if you take a leper out of a leper colony and then you uh, treat them and they get healthy and then you put them back into a leper colony, what's going to happen? Right. Yeah, the same thing. They're just going to get, they're just going to catch leprosy again and you're right back where you started. Um. Okay. Well. Well. Ken. What about uh, people of faith? Now. Now. I. I don't want the listeners to misunderstand because most people that listen to my show know that that I have a strong faith in God. Um. But. But having said that, I. I also have a a real concern about the faith community. And how we have approached the addict and alcoholic for a lot of years, it, you know, there's there's been kind of a kind of a sense of well, 
The reason you relapse is because you don't have enough faith. The reason you relapse is because you don't love God enough and you just need to try harder and, you know, all that that stuff. And um, we, we do a thing here, and you heard the promo for it, called Recovery Life, educating the faith community on the truth of addiction and recovery. And uh, it has been frustrating because there's this mentality within the faith community that, you know, just... Just, you know, turn your life over to the care of God and all will be well. Um, it's not that simple, is it? Well, as you know, that's part of our program. Oh, absolutely. So that's, one, that's one of our steps that we really hold dearly to our hearts, that we know that it, it is totally necessary in order to get long-term recovery, but it's not the end all. Right. You know, it's not the only thing that's going to work. That's why there's 12 steps. That's one of the 12 steps. But if you don't have the whole component, like I've seen people that go out and make their amends, you know, and they say, oh, I'm going to say sorry to everybody. That doesn't work. You need the whole, you need all of the 12 steps in order for the program to work. So have you have you worked with people uh, of faith that, have had that kind of mentality. Well, you know, Johnny, Johnny was gave his life to Jesus twenty four years ago. What's the deal? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, you know, it, it it really does boil down to that that God is the one. You know, like right? You said, I mean, I, I always talk about God, and God's the one that saved my life, and God's the one that you know I pray to every single day, right? Um, and and my faith is so it's been. The, the strongest, as I, the more years I get sober, the stronger my faith grows. Me too, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just an, an amazing, you know, part of my recovery. But yet, if you leave it to only faith, um, you're, I wouldn't make it. I have to do, it's, you have to do the, foot, the footwork. You know, you got to go out there and do the work that, like I said, I have somebody come to my house and we do you know, breathing yoga three times a week, and I do meditation one day a week at my house on, on a Monday night. And, you know, so, and plus I go to my 12-step meetings, and I sponsor people, and, I, you know, so it's the whole package. If you really love your loved one, and you think that they just didn't pray enough, it's about the whole package. They have to do everything in order to get into recovery. It's not just praying. If praying worked, Everybody would be so because their families pray for them all the time. You bet, <laughs> you you bet, you, you bet. Well, we have we have, we have, we have to do our, our our part. It's 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 a working relationship with God, uh, and uh, you know it. The thing that I was taught years ago, and I had to be kind of retaught because I was taught wrong, was well, Monty, the reason you relapse because I was the thirty day wonder for a long time years ago. And I couldn't understand. I mean, I loved God with all my heart and my soul and my strength. I'd been to Bible college. I was a youth pastor. I was an associate minister. And it was, you know, my, my addiction was, was raging. And uh, I was approached with, well, you just aren't serious about your relationship with God. I was, Ken, I was dead serious about my relationship with God. I was. Um, but what I realized was I was trying to get, you know, I was trying to stay clean and sober by my works alone. I was trying to just buck up and get up at 5.30 in the morning with my Bible and do my devotions, and that was going to do it and, and stuff. But I didn't have any of the other tools. And um, I got ostracized for not leaning on God only. And what I found out was Part of leaning on God was following his directions and doing the work. And there wasn't any, exactly. there wasn't anything unbiblical about that. There wasn't anything uh, 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 unholy about that. It was actually, actually the opposite. It was exactly what I was supposed to do. Uh, and that's when things clicked for me. Uh, but it, 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 it took a long time. Um it, do you ever have anybody uh, uh, do when, when you're doing an intervention? Do you ever have anybody just take off and not come back, or most of them stick around? Uh, you mean on the intervention? Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, I, I I'm the kind of interventionist that likes to follow them and make their life a living nightmare. That's <laughs> in the process. <laughs> love that. I just love turning their world upside down and 
you know, making it a reality. Because once they know that that's going to be a reality for their family, yeah. they start thinking again and saying, well, maybe it's better if I do get sober because my family's gone crazy. Right. You know, so right. if I'm chasing them down, I'd rather do that. But then there are some that just are so sick. And I educate my families. It doesn't, it's not a negative, but they're not going to go that day because they're just so sick. And nothing matters to them. They're so numb out that no matter what consequences you present, they're not going to feel them. They don't feel it. They're too numb. But with, an amount, with a certain amount of time, they will feel that pain. And if they don't, we keep turning up the heat because we all, as human beings, have thresholds of pain. We just got to figure out what their threshold is and create it so then they do surrender. Like I said earlier about leading a horse to water, we're getting it so thirsty that they're going to say, I'd rather be in recovery than sitting here and doing what I'm doing. Yeah, I- I- exactly. I- exactly. So, so, so just reading a letter and telling your loved one how much you're hurting because of their behavior isn't always going to be the thing that, that cracks the egg open, is it? Yeah, that's just the beginning stages. And, yeah. And that doesn't even really, you know, that opens it up. But those aren't the consequences that are going to motivate somebody. They've seen their family cry. They've seen them upset. It's the second part of the intervention where the family says, you know, and if you do not stay in treatment, then this is what I'm prepared to do. And then all of a sudden they start feeling a little discomfort. Right. They, they're not used to that. So, so, do families, for the most part, stick to their guns and actually follow through with those consequences when the addict does not follow through with his responsibility? What's that? Do the families, for the most part, do they do they stick to their guns? Do they actually follow through with those consequences they've laid forth when the addict, uh, when he or she? decides to leave treatment early or decides not to 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 follow through do, for the most part do they actually stick to their guns and say okay we told you what was going to happen and then they actually follow through i asked the question twice because i wanted you to say it twice right that's the most important part of an intervention is once the addict starts feeling better looking better, smelling better, sounding better. <laughs> the families <laughs> the families are the first to drop the ball and let go of the consequences. Wow. And that's the secret of recovery. Because if you're a high-licensed professional, you think that licensing board is going to drop the ball and say, oh, okay, you told me that you're sober, and, you know, I believe you because you have six months or you have 30 days, so we're going to let you have your license with no restrictions. <laughs> just, you know, we think you're doing great. <laughs> or the drug court, right? You said you love drug courts. Right. The, court doing, the judge is going to be like, oh, yeah, we're going to we're going to wash out that felony because you're doing so good. You're so proactive in your recovery. You know, right. they're not going to do that. Right. They're, they're not going to do it. And the secret of re- long-term recovery is just that. The family has to be consistent for a minimum of 12 months, a minimum of 12 months. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, 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 uh, I'm laughing, but really it's tragic, isn't it? To do all that work and then watch the family not follow through. Oh, it's heartbreaking. And then what do you do? You, you can't sit there and say, I, no, no, do it this way. Do it this way. They won't listen. So you have to be firm with saying, I don't agree with this. I don't, I don't, uh, you know, I'm not co-signing this. But I'm the, you're the client, so I'm going to follow your lead. But I'm telling you, when, when things go awry, awry, I'm going to be here for you. And that's when they come back and they say, okay, Ken, it did work. You know, you're, you were right. It didn't work. Okay, this time we're willing to do it your way. Yeah. And, you know, it's a process because they're the first ones to drop the ball. Right, right. Oh, uh, wow. Uh, okay, uh, uh, folks, we're going to take our last break. When we come back, I've got a, a, a very personal question for Ken, so don't go away. Um, his website, both websites, intervention911.com and kenseelycommunities.com, both links uh, are up on our website here at Take 12 Radio. Uh, if you need help, 
uh, you could call 866-888-4911. 866-888-4911. Freedom, or excuse me, uh, intervention911.com. So don't go away. More with Ken Sealy when we return. Listen. Do you have a loved one that is suffering from a drug or alcohol addiction and is unable or even unwilling to seek help? Well, if you've tried unsuccessfully on your own to get that individual the help they desperately need, then an intervention may be the only chance you have of saving that person's life. Here's the number I want you to call. 877-487-1111. 877-487-1599. You don't have to wait until your loved one hits bottom. By then, it could be too late. Call Broad Highway Recovery now. 877-487-1599. If not you, then who? Addiction is the number one health threat in our world today. It affects more people than any other malady, and yet the solution to this health crisis gets the least amount of attention. May I introduce to you a media outlet that's doing something about that. KHLT Recovery Broadcasting home of the Take 12 Recovery Radio Shows, is the world's only faith-based radio station broadcasting 24 hours a day, seven days a week with the solution to the addiction problem. Visit Take12Radio.com for recovery talk and positive music and be ready to be set free from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. That's Take12Radio.com on your internet dial. Green-eyed lady, passion's lady, dressed in love, she lives for... Welcome back, uh, recover family, <clears throat> advocates, and those of you who perhaps need to be in recovery. I'm glad you tuned in to us uh, today here at Take12Radio.com on your internet dial. Ken Seeley, founder and CEO of Ken Seeley Recovery Communities and Intervention 911 is our guest today. Um, listen, Ken, uh, you've been doing this for, for quite a while, and uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the show your own recovery process uh, and I, I ask this of a lot of people that are in the field because I think it is so important. And sometimes um, people that are that are involved deeply in more than just meetings that are doing what, what I'm doing, what you're doing, what Matt does and some of these others, um, it, we understand how vital it is for us to stay on top of our own uh, recovery process and, and what we're doing for ourselves. Uh, what do you do, uh, for Ken to make sure that Ken stays okay? Well, you know, I think my firm belief, if you work in the industry and you're in recovery from an addiction or addictions, right? I think you have to turn up the heat and, and hold yourself accountable to, you know, more meetings, more things that, you know, Things out there, use the modalities that are out there available to us um, to support our recovery. Because, um, you know, I what I do is like with, a year and a half ago, I went to Pine Grove's tech program for 11 weeks of inpatient treatment. Um, and I didn't relapse. It wasn't about a relapse. It was about dealing with trauma from, you know, being a little kid and digging out there and, and doing that work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Last year, I went to Spirit Lodge for a five-day silent meditation. Wow. Um, you know, so I'm always looking at, and, and this year I'm looking at doing something regarding my eating disorder. You know, I, I, I'm a binge eater, and I, I overeat, so I want to focus on that this year. So you, I think it's really, really important for me. I, I put my recovery before my work, before anything in my life. Because without my recovery, I have nothing. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and don't you think that a lot of professionals uh, much of the time kind of fall into the trap? Well, you know, I'm working with all these people and doing all this stuff, so that's, that is that is taking care of myself, and they actually miss the point. Oh, my God, that's the worst thing. You see them crash and burn every time. Yeah. You know, I've never seen anybody make it that, you know, that, that's one of our, our, anybody that works in our organization that's in recovery they have to put their personal recovery first or else they can't work with us because without that, there, there's no there's no hope. We've seen so many people burn that work with us that, you know, well, I'm on the phones all day helping people and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, they're heading towards a relapse. They're heading towards a relapse. They're angry all the time. And, and what happens? They relapse. You know, it, working in the field is not putting your recovery first. No, 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 it's not. And I think people, even in, in the 12-step rooms, sometimes get to thinking that service work is the end all, too. And they get so wrapped up in service work. What happens when you burn out on service work and you don't have a connection with a higher power? You're in deep weeds. They'll never make it long-term recovery. They just, it's, it's, I mean, we, we watch it. You know, as we watch these people that make it and don't make it, you know, I'm watching the ones that, aren't just clean and sober, but that are happy in their own skin. Yeah. But those are the ones I want to be around, and those are the ones that I shoot to be, you know, the goals to have for my own personal life. And it, it takes the work. You think I want to get up and do yoga three times a week? You go into <laughs> breathing yoga. <laughs> it's not even like real yoga where you get the physical. It's more about breathing, and, and, and it's, it's more of a meditation yoga. Uh-huh. So... I don't want to do that. You know, I don't want to go to 12-step meetings the rest of my life. That's not what I want. But I know that's how I'm going to keep comfortable in my own skin. So I'm going to do it. Yeah, you bet. You you bet. It's like the guy that has to do kidney dialysis three times a week. He didn't want to do that. But if he wants to live, you know, it's... Exactly. Yeah, it, it's required. Well, well, Ken, I really appreciate you taking the time today and uh, being back on the show. It's always, always great to have you on. Well, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And it was an honor and a pleasure to do it with you. A- absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, you're, you're down in Palm Springs. <clears throat> uh, uh, what, a, what a beautiful area of the country to be in. I know we, we had mentioned you're right across from Michael's house, uh, another uh, – a great place that provides a great service. Uh, folks, you can go to Intervention 911. Uh, if you want to see what Ken Seeley looks like, his beautiful mug is right there, right on the front page. And uh, and find out information about Intervention 911. And go to com and check that out as well. Any last words for the listeners, Ken? No, I, I just think that if you want the secret, come let us help you find it. Let us help you get to the point where you, too, can achieve long-term recovery. We all deserve it. Everyone out there suffering deserves that. Right. Yeah. Amen to that. Amen to that. All right. Ken, stay on the line as we close out. <clears throat> Folks, hey, listen. <clears throat> Do something now that will make the person you will be tomorrow proud to have been the person you are today. Many thanks to our guest, Ken Seeley, uh, for today's show Don't forget, my friends, Take12Radio.com on your internet dial. Take12Radio at Comcast.net is our email address. And uh, if you'd like to be on the show or if you have suggestions, uh, just go to our link on our website that says Be On The Show. Type in the little information thing. Don't forget our recovery cartoon caption contest. Uh, We run that every month. And uh, this year, uh, Mark Lundholm uh, is sponsoring that. And we're giving away... Uh, some live DVDs and CDs from Mark Lundholm, probably the number one nation's number one recovery comedian out there. Check that out. It's for fun and for free. Until our next broadcast, this is the Monty Man along with Ken Seeley. We're wishing God's perfect serenity for you. Until next time, God bless. This has been a broadcast of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting. Hey there. If you're listening on the Bill Post Radio Network, Bill Post is coming up in just a few seconds. 
If you're not, don't forget to check out Bill's shows Monday through Friday, 12 to 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time at Bill Post. 